Well, thanks everyone for sticking around, uh, and uh, it's an honor to be here and be able to uh, talk with you guys. Um, we heard a lot of interesting stuff about uh, work that's being done by Che and uh, with sound therapy as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the data side of things and some work that uh, we at Hybrid are uh, beginning and proposing to do in the future. Uh, I'll talk about things from the AI and machine learning side, uh, and I'll just dive right into this presentation. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, I'm going to talk about applying AI and machine learning to EEG data. So, first of all, you're probably all pretty aware of just how amazing artificial intelligence has been doing recently with all sorts of problems. For example, diagnosing medical conditions like skin conditions better than a team of doctors, uh, Google's Alpha Zero playing Go, Chess, and Shogi better than a human, and machine translation, which has just become so uh, reliable, if, if not perfect yet, it's pretty amazing. And how is all of this achieved? It really comes down to nothing but data, lots and lots of data. Uh, and that's one thing that we're lacking a little bit in the EEG world. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, difficulties there and challenges and opportunities. Um, so what you see out of one electrode, essentially, when you break it down from an EEG from EEG data, uh, you have the uh, delta wave, which is low frequency, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. You can pull all of those out from one electrode. But then overlaid on that are all sorts of artifacts. Uh, here we have shown an artifact from the eyes, like blinking or looking around, artifact from muscles, artifact from the heart. If you put all that together, you get uh, th this is pulled out from every electrode, so all of these signals are overlaid on uh, the voltage from each electrode. And this is a set of electrodes from an EEG uh, measurement. And on the top, you have the electrodes that are close to the eyes, so they register this large uh, signal from eye blinking. And you can imagine how you'd be able to uh, process this to remove these artifacts. There are all sorts of other artifacts that can come up in trouble with data that isn't collected well or headsets that aren't applied well. So these are big challenges which Jay uh, mentioned when we talked earlier uh, that face scientists and researchers working with the EE data. You've got the artifacts, uh, you have the quality of the collected data, like who recorded it, how well did they actually apply the electrodes to the scalp and so forth. And then, as I said earlier, simply the quantity of data is a limiting factor. A lot of the work that's been done has been with 50 or fewer, and 50 is a lot of uh, samples for EEG research these days, but it's nowhere near the millions that are needed for doing real uh, quality uh, neural network uh, applications. Uh, additionally, um, so EEG data, they look at the amount of signal in each of uh, five different frequency bands, delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. And that's, that's sort of like saying, let's take an image and look at the amount of red, green, blue, and yellow at each of four different points and try to classify it with just that. You aren't going to be able to do very well. So that's, that gives you sort of a feel for how far away we are from having enough data to really uh, read a state, measure a, a very particular state using EEG data. Hey, Dan, uh, can you explain what yeah. artifacts are? Many of us here don't know what that means. Artifact? Yes. Okay, yes, yeah, so that's... Uh, here on this plot you can see uh, it, an artifact is something that you don't want in your data, essentially. So it might be here if the subject blinks or moves their eyes around, you get this stuff going on. Or if they clench their jaw, you might get something like this going on. And you see that here in the real raw EEG data with this, this big hump happens. That's because someone blinked. 
So that doesn't give you anything interesting as far as trying to understand the state of the person's mind. Uh, so you need to remove those things before you can do any really interesting uh, science with the EEG data. Uh, and then there are all sorts of, those are just examples of artifacts. There's all sorts of other stuff that can happen uh, that makes it challenging uh, that when you get raw EEG data. So it's a challenge to get it, get clean EEG data, and it's a real limit for uh, researchers right now. So I want to point out also next that there are two types of data that we're interested in tracking here and you know being attentive to. Uh, one is measurements of the subject state, the, like the EEG. Uh, Jay also mentioned how making measurements with ultrasound. So those are directly measuring something of the subject's state. But we're also interested in metadata about how the data collected. EEG da metadata include things like model headset used, how many sensors, data sampling rate, uh, you know, how well the technician applied the headset uh, prepared the subject, instructions that were given, where it was the data were taken. Uh, the environmental conditions might be things like if you're doing sound therapy, uh, what exactly were the sounds that the subject was subjected to? You want to you want to do correlations between these. You need to record a lot of external data about the environment. And finally, uh, and it's something that Jake was a challenge in doing is uh, uh, some of his research. When you get a data set, you don't know that it's it's not good until you start working with it. Uh, and that's uh, another problem that we'd like to solve is have data that is verified to be good. And you'd also want to know who verified it. So it's sort of signed off as being data. There's other state data that could be useful. The ECG is the uh, heart electrocardiogram. Heart rate variability, also brain frequency variability, people are looking at. And then just self reported state, and how do you feel things like that? Uh, I personally think that uh, introspection data, subjective experience, is really important. Uh, so, if we are successful at generating a lot of clean data, what could be done? Well, the, the truth is we don't really know yet, and that's that's what makes this research uh, just the principle of what could be done is exciting. We can compare what could be possible to how uh, quality data helped in the process of gene editing. There's a company called AdGene, which started a uh, an independent uh, nonprofit repository for uh, plasmids, which are segments of genetic material, and they would, just for the cost of making a copy, which is like 60 bucks, they would send out copies of this genetic material to any researcher who wanted to use it. And that's really credited by a lot of people for uh, all the advances in gene editing, which has just progressed extremely rapidly recently. We, we would propose a similar model for EEG data to have a repository where uh, we have samples, uh, lots and lots of data which has been uh, validated and well documented with metadata. And uh, so uh, Kumar is going to go into a little more detail about uh, our ideas in that direction, how we would store it and how we would document it. Uh, but we really believe that this is going to be a powerfully enabling platform for future EEG uh, research and uh, will really help accelerate the uh, discovery of uh, and understanding in the space. Uh, and that's all, all I have to say, so uh, I'm going to hand it over to Kumar now.